segment five, the nature of the threat. <clears throat> we just had Mark Stein here. Sure. So let me, let me test out the thesis. In America alone, Mark Stein presents uh, the startling demographic argument, which is fundamentally that Western populations in Europe are shrinking, Muslim populations are expanding, and there's a kind of vacuum. Muslims are moving into Europe. So, and furthermore, and now this, this is the bit I'd like you to evaluate. I'm going to quote Mark. There are moderate Muslims, but no moderate Islam. All of the official schools of Islamic jurisprudence commend Sharia and jihad. Right. So a moderate Muslim is moderate to the extent that he's a little relaxed sure. about the practice of his own faith. Yes. I don't agree with Marx. You don't? No. I'm, I was born a Muslim. I was born to a Muslim secular family. I was born to a Muslim secular Shia family in Lebanon. My family were modernist. They interpreted the faith in a, modern, in a, in a, in a moderate way. Uh, none of our, the women in our family were ever you know, the, veiled. Uh, it was a modern interpretation of Islam. They thought of themselves as good Muslims, and they didn't want these radical Islamists telling them how to worship and how to practice their own kind of Islam. But people who say that there is no moderate Islam trouble me because I know that the battle for Islam is not yet lost. And if I may say here be a slight propagandist for this project we are doing at Hoover on Islamism. And the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Right. We're doing this project called uh, the Herb and Jane Dwight Working Group on Islamism and the International Order. And we have a number, we have a series of good working papers. We have books that are, a couple of them have already come out, more to come. We don't believe the battle for Islam is, is lost. We believe it's an open battle. We know that the, that the Islamists, the radical Islamists, are trying to hijack the faith and weaponize Islam, so to speak, to use, to use that term. But I can't, go far, I can't go that far and say there is no moderate Islam. I know, for example, there are many jurists in the Islamic world who are keen to get Islam back from the radicals. I know there are even Saudi jur jurists in the heart of Saudi Arabia who now understand that the drift toward radicalism is now a menace to the kingdom. And I know that the king of Saudi Arabia, to whom these religious scholars really in the end answer, he's already drawn the line that we can't just say we have to declare jihad against infidels and so on. Uh, we can't say that the mixing of the genders in school is wrong. So I think it's too, it's too bleak right, the, well, way, the way Mark Stein would put it. It's not my view. Let me give you a little more bleak sure. Stein here. <clears throat> Stein writes, Mark writes, quote, uh, that there are only, quote, three possible resolutions to the present struggle, close quote. And he just clicks through them. Sure. One is that uh, the West could submit to Islam, and that means the end of Western civilization. Okay. That's out. Two, we could destroy Islam. Just be cold-blooded about it. But, quoting Mark, the slaughter would change America beyond recognition, close quote, and to put it mildly. Sure. Three, reform Islam, but, quote, ultimately only Muslims can reform Islam. All the free world can do is create conditions that increase the likelihood of Muslim reform, close quote, including a democratic Iraq, making progress in Afghanistan, and so forth. All right, so series of so, questions around that. And the first, of course, is do you agree with that fundamental analysis? Are th th those are the three choices. That right. seems right, doesn't right. it? Right. I mean, there I could walk with him to, through the Aleppo Bazaar, if you will, with Mark. Um, we can't destroy Islam. Islam is 1.5 billion people, right. all the way from Indonesia in the east to Morocco in the west. It's a vast, it's one-fourth of mankind. Islam is vast and varied. It's one form of Islam in Indonesia, quite another form of Islam in Pakistan, quite another form of Islam in Iraq. For example, I had the honor of interviewing in Iraq and getting to meet and see Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, the most, the most revered Shia jurist in the entire Shia world. You come to his home, it's separated from the street by a piece of batik, a very modest home where this greatest of, of jurists with enormous power over the believers in Iran and Iraq just is sitting on, on a cushion on the floor with a fan overhead and a modest place and a belief in democracy and a belief in the human rights of Iraqis and a dread, like when you see him, when you talk to him, a dread of anything radical, bombers, radicals, jihadists, he, he loathes all this. So, you know, there's all kinds of Islam. Now, where Mark Stein is right, 
the battle for Islamic reform is a Muslim battle. You know, what we can do is we can help, if you will, nudge the Islamic world in the right direction. We can... Well, what's a nudge? What's a nudge? Well, we nudge them in Iraq. We created the conditions in Iraq. All right, so a, a nudge can be quite a big, difficult, bloody thing. Right. Indeed, we nudge them with the diplomacy of freedom of George W. Bush, which Barack Obama abandoned. President George W. Bush talked about the reform of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and was very forthright about it. Fuad Ajami on Barack Obama's speeches in foreign capitals, quote, while the Europeans and Muslim crowds hailed him, they damned his country all the same. Mm -hmm. For his part, Mr. Obama played along and in Ankara, Cairo, Cairo, Paris, and Berlin, he offered penance aplenty for American ways. So on the one hand, we have a president who's doubled down in Afghanistan. Sure. Over the opposition of his own supporters, he sends in an additional 30,000 troops. And on the other hand, we have a man who apologizes for the United States. Right. What, we have the, him for a minimum of another two and a half years. Right. And possibly, if he wins a second term, six and a half more Absolutely. years. How is he going to... What, what, what can we expect from him? Well, look, Barack Obama is the one who increased the drone strikes in Pakistan and then has this kumbaya foreign policy, let's all love each other and let's do multilateralism. He's a very good politician. He's a very interesting man. He's not the caricature that, you know, the people who don't like him, they have to understand that your name can't be Barack Hussein Obama and be elected president of the United States without enormous talent. He's got talent aplenty. Here's what he's done. And I think in that he was poorly advised. He doesn't understand this Arabic expression, which I will offer our audience. My brother and I against my cousin. My cousin and I against a stranger. There's one thing Arabs and Muslims don't like, which is someone who comes into their midst and trashes his own. Mm. Trashes his own. President Obama walked into Cairo and spoke, spoke poorly of the Iraq war and apologized for America. It was a terrible mistake. And even the people at the receiving end, they may enjoy his taunts of President Bush and his attacks of the Iraq war, but you are never respected. If you break with your own, you break with your own. Fuad Ajami, author of The Foreigner's Gift, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you for joining us.